section one, you will hear a conversation between a relative and his nephew. The relative is talking to his nephew related to his college and car driving. You have some time to look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. The conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello, good morning. How are you, my dear? Hello, I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm in the pink of my health. So, tell me, has your college started? Yes, it's been almost a month. So, are you happy over there? Yes, absolutely. How do you go to college each day, train, bus or your own vehicle? Presently, I'm going by bus, but sometimes, if I have time, I prefer walking, as it's not much far away. The nephew goes to the college by bus, so the answer to the given questions is bus, which is written as an answer for the example. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, good morning. How are you, my dear? Hello, I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm in the pink of my health. So tell me, has your college started? Yes, it's been almost a month. So, are you happy over there? Yes, absolutely. How do you go to your college each day? Train, bus or your own vehicle? Presently, I'm going by bus. But sometimes, if I have time, I prefer walking, as it's not much far away. So, don't you want your own vehicle? Yes, of course. One day I will have my own vehicle. But why don't you have one right now? As you know, I've just started my college and it will take time to buy my own vehicle. I will try to buy one when I'll start my post-graduation. Oh, really? That is good. That means you want to buy a vehicle with your own money. Yes, you've got it right. I don't want to take help from my parents. Do you have your driving licence? Yes, I do have it. So you can drive, right? Absolutely. My mother made sure that I learned driving at the right time and right age. That is a good thought. Tell me, if I give you my car to drive, will you drive it? But why? As you know, I'm an old man now. It is difficult for me to drive. So you can take my car and also I'll be glad if you drop me and pick me up sometimes. That way both our problems will be solved. That is so sweet of you. But I can take my dad's car to pick and drop you. For that you don't have to give me your car. Now look at questions 6 to 10. As the talk continues, answer question 6 to 10. Listen, I've been invited to an opera show as the chief guest and I want you to accompany me. That's so pleasant. It will be a great pleasure to accompany you. When is the opera show? It is on Sunday the 15th of this month. And where is the opera show? It is in our city auditorium next to Nemore Road and the timings are 6pm to 9pm. So... You come to my place at 5pm? Definitely. I'll be there at 5pm sharp. Oh, I forgot to tell you that I've changed my house, so note down the new address. It is B Block 42. Earlier it was A Block 42. So only a change in the block. OK, got it. See you on Sunday. Take care. Give my blessings to your parents. Bye bye. Bye bye, dear. That is the end of section 1. You will now have some time to check your answers. Section 2. You are going to hear an interview with Helen Zausman, who is a renowned and successful local radio presenter. She hosts mostly breakfast shows and is also an award-winning podcaster. 
She will give her tips on audio success with the listener. First look at question 11 to 16. Now listen to the recording and answer questions 11 to 16. People say it is very difficult to get a job on the radio. But they're lying. Ignore their tales of painstakingly working their way up through hospital radio, community radio, ham radio, of badgering the local radio station in their native backwater just to be allowed to empty the bins. Then one right Mr Graveyard Shift was too drunk to do his show so you stepped in instead, and a radio star was born, of how after five, fifteen, fifty years at the coalface, they were finally offered a show on a station people actually listen to during daylight hours. No, you can start a tip-top radio career in one easy step, and that is to be famous from the television. That's all there is to it. Just ask Fern Cotton, Graham Norton or Jamila Janil. But if you're not famous from telly, don't worry, you still have a chance, as long as you're a retired sportsman or Ronnie Wood. Unfortunately, I lack the foresight to be Ronnie Wood. Furthermore, when I was a fresh graduate with just a student radio award and a handful of radio career dreams, I lacked the smarts, the ingenuity and the doggedness required to bash down doors in the radio industry. Over the years, a few gigs did trickle in performing sketches on a late-night Radio 1 comedy show, writing jokes for the Now show, but nothing that was building to a career. In the meantime, I supported myself with such unrelated jobs, such as scouting houses for 60-minute makeover, proofreading books about cricket, filtering out the more threatening posts sent to BBC News readers, administrating benefits, typing up novels for rich elderly people teaching knitting and Latin, playing Gockenspiel at festivals. Then in January 2007, my friend Ollie Mann and I started making a podcast. Answer me this, for no better reason than because we would. Now look at questions 17 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. And although the show has reaped dividend way beyond what we had imagined, two Radio Academy Awards, a spin-off book and a proper radio jobs, there remains no better reason to make podcasts than because you can. If you have an idea, you don't have to wait for someone to commission it and you can execute it exactly how you want. If you want to be a presenter or a producer or a writer... You can try out all three, perhaps even simultaneously. You can practice and experiment with those roles without the pressure of your employer witnessing and wasting their money on your embarrassing learning curve. And if you're serious about pursuing a career in audio, you really should demonstrate your enthusiasm for the medium by making some audio. Frankly, there's no excuse not to. It's not expensive or difficult because, at its simplest, you can record onto a smartphone, edit on free software upload to a free hosting service. I had precisely zero knowledge or experience of any of these things when I started podcasting. Indeed, I barely knew what a podcast was. Seems I learnt the hard way. Podcasting is a solitary business, so it doesn't immediately lend itself to being that most vital tool for career getting, making contacts. Yes, Radio is one of the many industries that reward the gregarious and practically everybody I've met in radio has found jobs through people they know or through people that the people they know. But even if, like me, you're a shut-in making podcasts in the living room that you rarely leave, you can make a concerted effort to make contacts. Note the names of producers you've made shows with you admire and email or tweet them to ask if you can meet to discuss possible work prospects over a cup of tea. 
get in touch with other podcasters and see if they'll acquiesce to leaving their living rooms sometime. Join networks such as Soundwoman, which provide regular opportunities for the like-minded to convene Hobnob and support one another in navigating the murky world of radio. In general, people don't mind being asked for help. At best, they'll be so flattered they're delighted to assist you in finding a toehold in the radio industry. And at worst, they just won't answer your email. This is not so terrible, nor is trying, but failing to get very far... The terrible thing would be not to try at all. So quit stalling and get on with it, now. That is the end of section two. You will now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. In this section, you will listen to a talk between Aaron Sorkin who was one of the best TV talker, and Mark Harris, who was an interviewer. Both are talking about Newsroom and how it sounds smart. First look at questions 21 to 23. Listen to the interview conversation and answer questions 21 to 23. People like me are going to be tempted to say that following Sports Night and Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip, this show is part three of your trilogy about the making of TV. There's something about live television that I find very exciting and romantic. I'm going to use the word romantic a lot, but you'd be closer to the truth to say it's a quartet with the West Wing that lives in that place of wish fulfilment, what Wilson calls a mission to civilise, and it keeps failing miserably, he keeps slipping on banana pills. I write this kind of character a lot, beginning with the first play and the first movie I wrote, A Few Good Men, the Tom Cruise character, or Andrew Shepard in The American President, or in a lot of episodes, Bartlett in The West Wing, and to an extent, Charlie Wilson in Charlie Wilson's War. Now look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen to the second half of the recording and answer questions 24 to 30. It's fantastic and really interesting. Tell me something more about your writing. I'm writing about not the difference between good and bad, but the difference between good and great. You take a guy who's a perfectly nice guy. He's doing fine. He's not breaking any laws and he covets the fact that people like him and he's popular. He covets the fact that he doesn't have a lot of enemies, and you make him have to risk that by reaching higher. When Wilson goes from being blandly neutral about everything to making his own opinions clear, it's a transformation that viewers of cable news will certainly recognise. But those guys sometimes become grandiose blowheads. Of course, but there's a bigger problem that I'm worried about first, and this all has to come with the caveat that I don't really know what I'm talking about. Come on. No, I mean it. All my training and experience and education has been in playwriting. I have no political sophistication or media sophistication. So if I was talking to Howard Kurtz or you, you could easily dismantle whatever argument I'm going to make. It is a layman's amateur argument. Oftentimes I write about people who are smarter than I am and know more than I do, and I'm able to do that simply by being tutored, almost phonetically, Sometimes. I'm used to it. I grew up surrounded by people who are smarter than I am, and I like the sound of intelligence. I can imitate that sound, but it's not organic. It's not intelligences. It's my phonetic ability to imitate the sound of intelligence. So what's the bigger problem then? The thing that I worry about more is the media's bias towards fairness. Nobody uses the word lie anymore. 
Suddenly everything is a difference of opinion. If the entire House Republican caucuses were to walk on the floor one day and say the earth is flat, the headline on the New York Times the next day would read, Democrats and Republicans can't agree on shape of earth. I don't believe the truth always lies in the middle. I don't believe there are two sides to every argument. I think the facts are the centre, and watching the news abandon the facts in favour of fairness is what's troubling to me. Would you like to enter politics? I want to make it clear, I'm not a political activist. I've met political activists, and they're for real. I've never marched any place or done anything that takes more effort than writing a cheque in terms of activism. Honestly, I'm a storyteller. I'm just as happy doing this as writing Sports Night or The Social Network or anything else. I don't have a political agenda. I'm not trying to change your mind or teach you anything. I'm not able to teach you anything. But back to my point, it seems very important that if someone on the right in the news screws up in a really bad way, that the media finds someone on the left who screwed up in some kind of way so that we can have a one from column A, one from column B kind of situation. And that if there are five from column A, there can't be only three from column B, because then they'll be accused of liberal bias. That is the end of section three. You will now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear an extract from the lecture given by a scientist on penguins. The most beautiful and attractive birds found in Antarctica. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. Penguins are a group of aquatic, flightless birds living almost exclusively in the southern hemisphere, especially in Antarctica. Highly adapted for life in the water, penguins have countershaded dark and white plumage and their wings have evolved into flippers. Most penguins feed on krill, fish, squid and other forms of sea life caught while swimming underwater. They spend about half of their life on land and half in the oceans. Although all penguin species are native to the southern hemisphere, they are not found only in cold climates such as Antarctica. In fact, only a few species of penguin live so far south. Several species are found in the temperate zone, and one species, the Galapagos penguin, lives near the equator. The largest living species is the emperor penguin. On average, adults are about 1.1 meter tall and weigh 35 kilograms or more. The smallest penguin species is the little blue penguin, also known as the fairy penguin, which stands around 40 centimeters tall and weighs one kilogram. Among extinct penguins, larger penguins inhabit colder regions, while smaller penguins are generally found in temperate or even tropical climates. Some prehistoric species attained enormous sizes becoming as tall or as heavy as an adult human. These were not restricted to Antarctic regions. On the contrary, sub-Antarctic regions harboured high diversity, and at least one giant penguin occurred at a region not quite 2,000 kilometres south of the equator, in a climate decidedly warmer than today. Now look at questions 36 to 40. Now listen to the second half of the recording and answer questions 36 to 40. The word penguin first appears in the 16th century as a synonym for great orc. When European explorers discovered what are today known as penguins in the southern hemisphere, they noticed their similar appearance to the great orc of the northern hemisphere and named them after this bird, although they're not closely related. The etymology of the word penguin is still debated. The English word is not apparently of French, Breton or Spanish origin, 
but first appears in English or Dutch. Some dictionaries suggest a derivation from Welsh pen, head, and gwyn, white, including the Oxford English Dictionary, the American Heritage Dictionary, the Century Dictionary, and Merriam-Webster, on the basis that the name was originally applied to the Great Orc, either because it was found on Whitehead Island in Newfoundland or because it had white circles around its eyes. An alternative etymology links the word to Latin pinguis, which means fat. In Dutch, the alternative word for penguin is fat goose and would indicate this bird received its name from its appearance. The number of extinct penguin species is debated. Depending on which authority is followed, penguin biodiversity varies between 17 and 20 living species. Some sources consider the white-flippered penguin a separate Eudipetula species, while others treat it as a subspecies of the little penguin. The actual situation seems to be more complicated. Similarly, it is still argued whether the royal penguin is merely a colour morph of the macaroni penguin. The status of rockhopper penguins is also argued. That is the end of section 4. Now you have some time to check your answers.